being a dreamer isn't easy, especially when you dream dreams which are not necessarily very popular. Joseph experienced this firsthand when he proclaimed his dreams to his brothers and father. Joseph found out quickly that believing in a dreaming God comes with hardship and heartache. Upon telling his family about his dreams, his brothers plotted to kill him and eventually decided to sell him to the Ishmaelites instead. While this narrative of hearing God's calling, acting on it, then facing persecution because of one's faith, will be a storyline which is repeated throughout the biblical narrative, there's something uniquely powerful about the story of Joseph. Because God never speaks directly to Joseph. The text mentions that the Lord was with Joseph, the Lord saved Joseph, and the Lord blessed Joseph. But not once does it say that the Lord spoke to Joseph, called to Joseph, pleaded with Joseph. God did none of these things. But rather, God gave Joseph a dream. And Joseph believed this dream. And not only did he believe the dream, but he proclaimed the dream to the world. And then by faith, he lived that dream into reality. In the time of Joseph, people believed there were two types of dreams. Ordinary dreams, which had very little significance. And the other types of dreams, which were believed to be signs of destiny. Some dreams, though, fall between these two, such as those in the story of Joseph. These dreams are less clear and require an interpreter. In the later chapters of Joseph's story, he will interpret various people's dreams, including the dreams of Pharaoh. His interpretations of these dreams will save the land of Egypt from famine. But these interpretations are still many years away when we meet Joseph in the opening chapters of his story. Joseph is just a 17-year-old boy, not yet able to interpret his dreams. And the other thing about Joseph's dreams is that while he dreamed of the favor God would show him over his brothers, he did not dream of how this would all become a reality, and he most certainly did not dream of all the persecution he would face. Despite all of this, though, he believed. His father, Jacob, favored Joseph, which is why Jacob gave him the brightly covered robe which we hear so much about. His brothers were irritated and angry because of the favor their father showed Joseph. And then Joseph began to dream dreams, which definitely they did not like. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brothers, and they hated him all the more. Forget the fact that Joseph was having these wild dreams. He was the younger brother. He was not supposed to be the favored son. Before Joseph even began telling them of his dreams, he was flipping their world on its head. He was disrupting the societal norms. But instead of trusting God, his brothers chose to lean into fear and laziness. They chose to totally disengage from their brother. Their fears of what Joseph's life and his dreams could mean for their lives were too powerful to overcome. So the natural disposition of Joseph's brothers was to settle into the routine of what was expected of them. They were the sorts of men who did not readily think or do anything different. Commonplace men who, when left to themselves, would have kept everything around them commonplace. But the fact that Joseph was around meant that they could not be left to themselves. His character broke in on their complacency. His restless imagination was always suggesting that life could have an exciting wideness if anyone were not too lazy or too fearful to explore it. But instead of embracing the dreaming imagination of Joseph, his brothers decided that his presence, with all its dreams and curiosity about the world around him, was far too threatening. So they plotted to kill him. Here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into the pits. Dreams are incredibly powerful, especially when they threaten to change the world around you. We are all familiar with Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, but when I think of Joseph's life, another civil rights leader comes to mind. 
A woman who should have been anything but a powerful voice of change. Miss Fannie Lou Hamer is an oft-forgotten or glossed over participant in the civil rights movement. Not because of her lack of influence, but precisely because of it. Miss Hamer's voice, whether she was singing or speaking, would echo throughout the building. Her passionate belief in a God who dreamed of love and inclusion for all people, palpable to those who were in her presence. She, just like Joseph, was pushed aside. Her dreams and belief in God too powerful for most to tolerate. In 1964, she stood on the floor of the Democratic National Convention and testified to the beating and persecution she endured when trying to register to vote. Her testimony so powerful that President Johnson held an impromptu press conference at the White House in hopes of pulling media attention away from Ms. Hamer's testimony. In one interview, when asked why she kept pushing forward, why she maintained a belief in a God that told her her dreams were within reach, she explained, whether I want to do it or not, I got to. This is my calling. This is my mission. Her life in many ways mirrored that of Joseph's. She had been sold, she had been beaten, she had been imprisoned, and yet she kept the faith and proclaimed her truth. All the while imploring and pleading with those around her to have faith in the power of a lovingly dreaming God. It's one thing. It's one thing I don't want to hear you say tonight after I've finished, and it won't be long. I don't want to hear you say, honey, I'm behind you. Well, move. I don't want you back there because you could be 200 miles behind. I want you to say, I'm with you, and we'll go up this freedom road together. As we heard the scripture of Joseph's reconciliation with his brothers read, I want to make sure not to gloss over the fact that between the time of Joseph's brothers selling him and their eventual reconciliation, there was a great deal of pain and suffering and when his brothers first arrived in Egypt, he did not immediately welcome them with open arms. Their reconciliation took time and a rebuilding of trust. I'm sure the same can be said for so many of us sitting here today. As we work to rebuild friendships, relationships with family members, or even find it in our hearts to return to churches where great woundings have occurred, Reconciliation does not happen overnight. But when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable enough to forgive or receive forgiveness, powerful healing and reconciliation can happen. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him. And then Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. Because God sent me before you to preserve life. In the chapter before this, Joseph's brothers were convinced that they were finally going to be killed. They felt surely the sins of their past had caught up with them, and they were now going to receive the punishment they rightfully deserved. They had, after all, plotted to kill Joseph, eventually deciding to sell him to the Ishmaelites instead. But what they found in Joseph was a forgiving heart a brother who was willing to extend them grace, even when they had not yet been able to do the same for themselves. In these first moments of reconciliation with Joseph, what they also learned was the power of God to redeem. So it is not you who sent me here, but God. He made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. In the life and fulfillment of God's dreams, they witnessed the inexhaustible goodness and grace of God, 
which could bend even the worst acts to God's ultimately redeeming purpose. You see, Joseph's brothers needed reconciliation not only with Joseph, but also with God. They had failed to have faith in the goodness of a dreaming God, but now they began to understand that while it might be hard to believe the dreams of God because they seem outlandish, or perhaps it's too scary to believe in a dreaming God because to do so would totally disrupt and alter all they know to be true. Despite all of this, God surely will make a way. In the weeping arms of Joseph, his brothers found grace and redemption. And Joseph, in the presence of his brothers, was finally able to reclaim all that had been lost so many years ago. He was the wildly imaginative dreamer who now fully understood the path his life had taken, and he was finally back in the arms of his family. Joseph was able to be reconciled with his family, not because he changed or stopped dreaming, but rather quite the opposite. He reconciled with his family because he was living into his truths. He was the dreamer. And that did not have to change for God or his family to love him. Again, as I read through Joseph's story, I'm reminded of Miss Hamer. If a woman who only 50 years ago was beaten, thrown in jail, and told that she was less than simply because of the color of her skin, if she can find a way to love and forgive her oppressors, I know then that the power of reconciliation is not just something contained within the scriptures. Rather, it is something that is real and can be lived out. The dream of radical love and unconditional acceptance is alive and well in the spirit of a dreaming God. And God is pleading for us to make space for these things to happen. There is undeniable pain and suffering in this world. One needs only to turn on the news or walk to the corner of Hamden and Monaco to find that people are hurting. Perhaps you need to look no further than the person sitting next to you. Or maybe you're sitting in your chair right now, believing that no one sees your pain and you are suffering in silence. But as the story of Joseph shows us, that while holding steadfast to a belief in a dreaming God is not without pain and suffering, it is also not without reconciliation, redemption, and wholeness. It takes immense vulnerability and courage. Those things I do not deny. But imagine, dream of what would be possible if we made space for that sort of radical love and unconditional acceptance. Perhaps Ms. Hamer says it best when she declared, We shall overcome means something to me tonight. We shall overcome means as much to me tonight as amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Because if grace has saved a wretch like me, then we shall overcome. Because he said, Sheep seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. Ask, and it shall be given. It was a long time, but now we see. We can see, and we can design a new day. Keeping the faith and believing that you can come is, at times, easier said than done. Because in all honesty, a few Sundays ago, I was sitting in the back, trying to figure out how I could gracefully bow out of preaching. <laughs> Back in July, I had met with Anne and asked to preach, but this, as this Sunday was growing closer, I was beginning to wonder if I had made a mistake when I asked for this chance. You see, I'm a hospital chaplain. Put me in any room in the hospital and I feel at peace. I feel God's presence and I'm sure of my calling to serve others. But here... Behind this pulpit, I'm terrified. <laughs> I lay in bed that Sunday night and decided that the next morning I would call Anne and tell her I just couldn't do this. I wanted to make Joseph, I wanted to be like Joseph, I wanted to believe in the dreams God had placed on my heart, but instead, like his brothers, I became fearful and began to doubt all that I believed and knew to be true. I thought I could do it, but I just couldn't. And then at 2 a.m., I got a text. 
a text that reminded me not, that not only can I stand up here and preach this sermon, but I must preach this sermon. At 2 a.m. I received a text from a young woman whom I have been a chaplain and friend to since 2009. Our conversations mostly deal with the topic of sexuality as she tries to live as a gay woman in the heart of the Bible Belt. Her journey towards reconciling her spirituality and her faith has been a painful one and she is still very much so trying to figure out how to live as a woman who is both gay and deeply in love with God. This was her text. I can't sleep. I can't stop wondering if I'm going to heaven. Here's why. I don't understand how my sexuality could determine my eternity. It makes me crazy to think about. How? How can love be so wrong? Love, the purest of all. How? And yet so many passages in the Bible indicate that I won't go to heaven because of it. I don't want to be someone who distorts the scripture so that it pleases me, but I just don't understand why. Being gay and trying to be Christian is probably the worst combination somebody could ever be. Being gay and trying to be Christian is probably the worst combination somebody could ever be. I read her words and my heart broke. I wept for a young woman who believes that her sexuality can separate her from the love of God. A young woman who believes that being gay and Christian is anything but something to embrace. My heart yearned for the day when she could hear a message of love and affirmation from the church. I wanted her to hear how deeply she is loved by God for who she is. And there is nothing she has to do or change about herself to earn God's praise and acceptance. I wanted her to hear that she is a fearfully and wonderfully made child of God, perfectly imperfect, just as she was created. My friend, just like Joseph, needed to hear those words. His brothers needed to hear those words. We all need to hear those words, the assurance that we are fearfully and wonderfully made children of God, perfectly imperfect, just as we are. I wanted her to hear all these things because, in truth, I know what it feels like to need to hear those words. I know what it feels like to desperately search for acceptance of self while wondering if there will ever be a place for you in the church. I know what it feels like to believe there is no way God could possibly love you for who you are. And I know what it feels like to wish you were anything but gay and Christian. I stand up here despite being terrified, all while believing in a dreaming God, because I know how important it is to hear someone stand behind a pulpit and say, I am gay and I am Christian and it is okay. <coughs> Those things are not incompatible. As a gay woman who is ordained to preach the good news of the gospel, I can no longer remain fearful of claiming the beloved child of God that I am. I must claim that I too have been made in the image of God. There is a wholeness that comes when I find a way to dream and to love. It's hard to explain to people though, because how do I explain what it feels like to fly freely among the stars? It cannot be done. It is something which people must experience themselves. You see, I am on a journey. We are all on a journey to find God in ourselves, to reach deep within our souls and harness the gifts that God has given to each of us, the power to dream infinitely and love radically. I'm learning to weep openly and to confidently declare I am who I am by first standing on the shore of the sea, toes touching the water and announcing to the world that I found God in myself and I loved her fiercely. It has been long and there are still many tough leaps of faith ahead of me, but the wholeness that I dream of, which exists at the end of this lifelong journey, is well worth the work. Because the best thing about dreams 
is the fleeting moment when you're between asleep and awake. When you don't know the difference between reality and fantasy. When for just one moment you feel with your entire soul that the dream is reality and it really happened. God longs for us to be able to live like this, to experience life in such a way that we question whether or not our reality is reality or dream. It is when we reach this point that we are allowing God the freedom to dream for us, to take us places that we could never go if we remain steadfast in our determination to be a people fixated on a reality that pales in comparison to the true dreams of God. Oh, to be able to stand eyes closed and hands raised, allowing myself to be overwhelmed by a vision of a world beyond my wildest imagination. I cannot help but smile at the wonder of God. The truth is, my fear has stopped me long enough from talking about and living into the dreams that the dreaming God has for my life. I'm tired of allowing my life to be ruled by fear and not by a dreaming love. The dreaming God tells me that the power of love can and will conquer all. The dreaming God tells me there is a place for everyone in the church. The dreaming God pleads for me to allow myself to be liberated from fear because all that stops me from dreaming and living out God's dreams for my life is fear. The dreaming God calls for me to look to the stars, to turn my eyes to the heavens, and see the infinite dreams God has for this creation. My story, our stories, are no different from that of Joseph's. We're all working to understand what it means to believe and have faith in a dreaming God. We have moments where we're like Joseph, passionately proclaiming our dreams to this world. And there are moments when we're like his brothers, terrified and fearful of a dream that we cannot yet see and that we will challenge all that we think we know. God does not stop dreaming. We must only find a way to be liberated from our fears so that not only can we believe, but we can also live into and make a reality the dreams God has for this world. God is dreaming for each of us. What dreams does God have for your life? How is God calling for you to be dreamers with wildly imaginative creativity? Joseph is not the only dreamer. We are all dreamers. So as you leave this place today, may you hear these words from God. My daughters and sons, lean in closer and finally be at peace. May you find what you seek, creativity, joy, realness, belonging, dreaming freedom. Allow my love to permeate your heart and soul. If you seek adventure, vulnerability is the path. Communion and fellowship that is where life is happening. A dreaming God is where life is happening. My daughters and sons live. Walk through the doors opened by love. Ordinary men and women, God makes sons and daughters. Where lives intersect, love looks different. May we allow others to be a source of hope. In my arms, you are home. The dreamer dispatched you to live into who you are, your authentic being. You are perfectly imperfect for this moment, but let it linger in your dreamer imaginations that we are never finished. And where the sacred will take you is life-giving. That is what God taught us. That was God's dream. Amen.